I want him to do is to go to board and look at how each of us in the RTOs and collectively how we can together build best models of practice to ensure that people seeking asylum and refugees who are eligible under this contract get to find the right course. And I think we've heard before how important that is and how long that might take and then to be supported throughout their course and then to hopefully you know, succeed like we've got our wonderful students' um, stories this morning. One of the things that we've done along the way is um, we've obviously worked closely with lots of RTOs and we've asked uh, some representatives of those RTOs to just share with us today what they've been doing and what they've learned in this space in terms of um, you know, supporting people through their enrolment, their induction, their study, um, maybe even what they've had to do as a whole of organisation in terms of putting in infrastructure. Um, at Victoria Polytechnic, um, we have a number of asylum seekers in our programs across a number of vocational education courses, including um, uh, aged care, um, Children's services, um, accounting, um, yeah, yes, um, uh, individual support and health services assistance. Um, the court, the students are uh, supported um, at um, enrolment. Before enrolment, they undertake the literacy and numeracy assessment and we use the ACER tool, the core skills profile for adults where their literacy and numeracy is determined, levels are determined. We also, um, we provide learning support in all our vocational courses at, um, and um, those teachers are working in a variety of models there co-teaching sometimes, they're offering offering open access um, where students can come and get additional support as well as one-to-one uh, -one or um, skills type lecture um, uh, workshops that are run as well. Um, in some of the areas we deliver we run and I think a speaker this, after, this morning I just heard um, spoke about a, an English and a vocational course running together and that model is all the content of the vocational course um, and the teacher from the English course are planning and developing the content and in that specific vocational area. So those two teachers working together, I know in one area it's three days of the vocational course two days of the English course and that supports those students um, to develop their English skills and all and the qualification <coughs> is a is a little longer than that normal qualification. Rosemary will talk about how the admin support. Uh, so the way that we manage the asylum seeker <coughs> enrolments at the moment is that we get the um, referrals through the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre uh, come through to a central um, office. So my office manages that process. We keep a track of them um, and we liaise with the relevant teaching department to alert them uh, to that uh, student. Uh, one thing though that we have noticed is that our online application doesn't actually cater well for asylum seekers. And we worked with our systems area to get that modified and it's actually been UAT uh, today. Uh, so we're hoping that that will get released soon where we will be able to identify asylum seekers, um, especially if they're going to be coming directly to us now, uh, really early in the piece that we, where we can make contact with them um, and get them in and support them through the process uh, of enrolling in a course. VU has um, career services and the students can access those additional services. Um, career services uh, where they uh, career counselling, mentoring, review of job application CVs, uh, events, workshops and career planning. There are, they have, students have access to that. They have access to the student wellbeing area. 
Um, and facilities such as libraries are open. The one at Footscray Park are open 24 hours a day. Um, and um, students can access sport and gym facilities as well. Our stories that, um, some innovative stories that as I was researching this, I was speaking to the various departments in one particular area. Um, a teacher who's delivering the course is a from, from a particular area in the world and he has a number of students who are from that same place and so we set up a coffee pre uh, post students students that have already gained the qualification and his current students and he set up a coffee club and they where they're meeting regularly and the students are the the um, students that have the qualification and are in are working out in the community are talking about the expectations of work and all those day-to-day -day things so that that's a really lovely story. Um, another, uh, the learning support, the role of the learning support is crucial for these students as well because they're offering them extra time and the manager of one particular area was telling me that extra time that the learning support teacher gave the student um, managed to get the student you know, through the qualification and that student has moved off to Sydney I think so that was a really good story and um, so good practice and we like to we're you know we want to build on those good practice stories and processes to make sure that we give the student the best possible opportunity to um, to get through the course successfully. Since we got our first referral from the ASRC we've had to the end of November 64 asylum seekers doing training with us, all in in an area I guess between them of common interest in hairdressing and beauty courses. 27 of those have graduated, um, five of them have chosen to go on to other courses and at the moment we've got uh, four that are on hold. Uh, one of them, I came here last week and spoke and I ran into him in the street as I left. He hasn't been to school for five months and we've had phone calls with him. He just says he's told us he's got head problems. And anyway, he said last week that he's had five months of psychological counselling. It was very evident when he came to us that he was very traumatised. Um, he seemed over time to get a little bit happier and smile more but then his, his legal issues came up and his visa issues and he told me that he's just been granted a three year visa but, um, and I said well are you going to come back to school and he said can I really come back? So he thought because he hadn't attended for a long time and hadn't necessarily returned our calls that he couldn't um, and I reassured him that he can, but he still won't come back until he has physically has the piece of paper in his hand that says he has a three-year visa. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea. We also have three others on hold that have got personal or legal issues and one who had to stop training to support the family. She's the child and supporting the parents and the other siblings. She got a job. So hopefully she'll come back over time. So what we've found in our experience is when we have our first encounter, we have to take things very slowly. They're quite scared. We're sort of authority figures. Um, they're very fragile. Um, they're very smart. They're often very educated in their own countries. They're very proud. They're intelligent. Uh, they're highly anxious because they're living with uncertainty each day. You know, they might have four weeks left of their current visa. Uh, some of them have mental health issues um, and need extra support. They're definitely, on the whole, very limited in their finances. Um, a lot of them have limited childcare and part of that is that affordability. They've got school-aged children that they've got to work around some of them are sole parents, just like the cohort of other students. Some have experience in what they are coming to us to train in, so it's very important for us to unpack what it is that they've done before. 
they're ambitious, they're motivated, and they're extremely grateful for the opportunity. So we haven't had anyone actually drop out, which is not the norm in your usual cohort of students. So that's how much they want to succeed in Australia. So they might be on hold, but they've still got the opportunity to come back. So we find, I find the pre-training review and enrolment process takes a lot longer and sometimes it takes three times as long as your average student enrolling. Um, you've got to take time to build the trust and the rapport with them and I usually try and if I sense that they're really, really frightened. I take them on a tour straight away. I introduce them to other students from their nationality. Um, I show them what it is we do um, so that we can relax them a bit and, and I step away if they want to have a chat to some of the students that speak their language so that they can ask some questions freely. Um, to, so the changes we've made is we offer them flexibility in hours. So if they've got to drop the children off and they've got to pick them up, they've got no family members in Australia to look after them during school holidays. Um, we'll let them do off-campus work during those times. They're, they're absolutely unable to come to school when their court issues are on. Most of them are too stressed. Um, if the visa's coming up, you know, to be reviewed, there's a lot of uh, appointments that they have to go to and they just need a break during that period. We offer very flexible payment plans now that the asylum seekers are paying for their own fees. So if their course costs $300 for their tuition fee, we'll let them pay it off at $25 a month, $12 a fortnight. We've had to be extremely flexible and overcome that sense of pride that they want to be able to pay for their course but it isn't possible for them to come up with $300. Um, we've changed how we charge for equipment. Before we had a $600 equipment fee, now we have a $100 bond and we lend them the equipment. And then slowly, slowly, if they need their tools in hairdressing, they can purchase them gradually but if they go for work in a salon, they won't necessarily need their own equipment. Um, the levels of English, a lot of people have some home tutoring or they've done some English. The fact that they're educated um, on the whole in their own language means that they tend to pick up the verbal English a lot better, particularly when they're dealing in our setting. They're dealing with clients every day, so we've got a simulated salon there. Um, but we do, we've had to um, employ someone who speaks Farsi um, so that when it gets to the technical aspects of the course, at least they can understand what it is that, they, that needs to be explained in their own language. Otherwise, we could end up with a client with no hair at the end of the day. So it's very important from a safety point of view. It's not something you're going to learn in an English class. It's still a technical side to a lot of qualifications. When a student starts with us, um, we have a buddy system for all new students, so they'll be allocated a buddy who'll show them the ropes. We're not a very big place, so it's not overwhelming, uh, so it will be a lot harder in your situation for them because they've physically got to find the rooms. So we just check in with them. We have a one-on-one -on -one meeting every couple of weeks to see how it's going, and we really closely monitor the attendance. Um, and try to know what's going on for them.